Good morning, church. It's great to be with you guys. My name is Jason. Thank you so much for choosing to worship with us today. Um, happy moving day to all of the sixth graders that are coming up from the warehouse. If you see a sixth grader, give them a high five today. Let them know that uh, it's exciting to have them over here now. It's not that scary. Um, but we're excited to be able to worship with y'all. Can we stand to our feet? As we do, I'm going to pray for us, and we're going to jump into worship. God, we just thank you for this morning, that we can be in your presence. God, I thank you for each person in this room this morning. God, I pray that you would just speak to each of us in a powerful way, that as we worship you, God, that you'd be glorified, that we would feel your presence in a new way in our life. God, I just thank you that we can sing to you. Thank you for the breath in our lungs this morning. God, we give it all back to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing, church.
Morning New Hope. Thanks so much for joining us today. Our mission here is to help people find hope one step at a time. If this is your first time visiting us, we'd love to connect with you after the service. Take a moment to stop by our guest services desk in the lobby for a small gift and more information about New Hope and our ministries. At New Hope, we believe that everyone has a next step in their faith journey. We want to love you where you're at, wherever that may be, and also help you to move forward in your relationship with Christ. For some, this next step might look like following Jesus' example in baptism. And we're so excited to celebrate this together again next month on Sunday, September 1st, during both of our morning services. More information can be found on our app and at newhopecc.org slash events. We're currently in a series on the book of Revelation, and we want to invite you to take an even deeper dive with us. Registration is now open for our next session of New Hope Studies, and this time we're headed to this very last book of the Bible. Whether you find Revelation intriguing, intimidating, or both, plan to join us beginning Monday evening, September 9th, for this 10-week in-depth study. Together we'll take it verse by verse as we unpack truths and begin to understand this book as the culmination of God's great story. For more info and to sign up, head to our app or newhopecc.org slash events. Our incredible care ministry is launching a brand new session of caregiver training beginning this fall. If you've ever wanted to know more about this ministry and how you can get involved, we're hosting an informational meeting today in our main campus immediately following our 11 o'clock service. If you haven't already registered for today's meeting, it's not too late. We still have space for you and would love to see you there. As always, we are so appreciative of your ongoing support for New Hope and our ministries. Your tithes and offerings make it possible for us to continue sharing the gospel here, there, and everywhere. If you'd like to give, you can set up a one-time or recurring gift online or place your offering in the boxes by the doors. And don't forget, August is Food Collection Month. We're collecting toiletries and unexpired, non-perishable food items all month long to benefit our neighbors right here in Williams County. Now, join us as we continue to turn our hearts and minds toward Christ. Well, good morning. Today is uh, Transition Sunday, so we have like kids moving classes, and, and we have maybe some new students in the room with us. School started this week, so we're, gonna, we're just going to kind of see who's in the room, all right? If you're a student of any school in the area, and you're in here this morning, I want you to raise your hand. Awesome, awesome. There's a lot of you. Um, yep, yep. We hope you have a great school year. Uh, how, how many college students specifically do we have in here? Whether you're going to school in the area, you're leaving for college soon, all right, well, several of you, that's awesome. We hope you have an incredible year. How many of you in here are parents of a current student? Yeah, yep. <clears throat> you know, how, how many of you, anybody in here, you sent your kid to like preschool or kindergarten this year? A few of you, yeah. It's like some, maybe some tears, you know, you're a little sad. We, we sang about turning mourning into dancing, I promise you. <laughs> this day gets way more joyful as they get older. You're like, yes. They're back to school, right? How many, how many educators in the room? Yeah, we have a lot of educators here, yeah. Thank you, guys. So it's like, we, we just hope you have an incredible, incredible year. Uh, again, if you're coming into this room this morning and you're in sixth grade, we're glad you are with us here this morning. Uh, we started last week in this series on Revelation, and uh, you know, I kind of gave you the warning, like, this is really an overview, right? We're, we're not jumping super into a bunch of details. That will be in our Bible study on Monday nights. And I want to encourage you, because you may be going like, well, I might have to miss a couple, so I'm not going to sign up. I, still sign up. Still go to the ones you can go to. They'll find a way to make sure you're caught up to speed and you're not missing anything, all right? So this is pretty overview, and I, I just want to make sure we acknowledge that because you're going to be like, oh, we didn't talk about this, and we didn't talk about this, and you're right. We didn't talk about it, and we might not talk about that. So I want to remind us, though, Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. This is a revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the events that must soon take place. He sent an angel to present this revelation to his servant John, who faithfully reported everything he saw. This is his report of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. 
God blesses the one, this is what I want us to key on, God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church, and he blesses all who listen to its message and obey what it says, for the time is near. Again, if you weren't here last week, we talked about how it can feel like the book of Revelation is unapproachable, and how it can be intimidating, and there's all this symbolism, and there's all this stuff, and we're like, I'm not, I don't have a theology degree, and I just, because I don't think I can understand it, I'm just not going to read it. I'm not going to try And again, I'll just remind us, you don't have to have a theology degree to read the book of Revelation. Why? You're going, well, there's a lot of confusing stuff in there. So wouldn't it help if I had a theology degree? Well, you know what's better than a theology degree is the Holy Spirit. Right? And the Holy Spirit can teach us the things that we need to know when we read God's Word. All right? So kind of a, I want to read, I don't have these up here, okay, these verses up here. But I want to just read for a second in Revelation chapter 1 because I want to bring some more specificity to who this is written to. And we need to keep this in mind as we read the book of Revelation. So Revelation chapter 1, starting in verse 4, just listen in. If you have a Bible, turn there. This letter is from John to the seven churches in the province of Asia. Again, remember we have a type of writing in Scripture, our epistles, which are letters to churches. Revelation is an epistle, as well as prophecy and those sort of things, all right? So this letter is from John to the seven churches in the province of Asia. Grace and peace to you from the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come from the sevenfold spirit before his throne and from Jesus Christ. He is the faithful witness to these things. The first to rise from the dead and the ruler of all the kings of the world. All glory to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by shedding his blood for us. He has made us a kingdom of priests for God his Father. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. Look, he comes with the clouds of heaven and everyone will see him. Even those who pierced him and all the nations of the world will mourn for him. Yes, amen. Verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord God. I am the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come, the Almighty One. I, John, am your brother and your partner in suffering and in God's kingdom and in the patient endurance to which Jesus calls us. I was exiled to the island of Patmos for preaching the word of God and for my testimony about Jesus. It was the Lord's day. This is so interesting. He's exiled to this island, right? It was the Lord's day, and I was worshiping in the Spirit. Like, It didn't, his outcome, his story that he was currently in, this exile, did not stop him from worshiping. So it was the Lord's day. I was worshiping in the spirit, and suddenly I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet blast. It said, write in a book everything you see and send it to the seven churches in the cities of Ephesus, Smyrna, uh, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. When I turned to see who was speaking to me, I saw seven gold lampstands, and standing in the middle of the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man. He was wearing a log robe with a gold sash across his chest. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were like polished bronze refined in the furnace, and his voice thundered like mighty ocean waves. He held seven stars in his right hand, and a sharp two-edged sword came from his mouth, and his face was like the sun and all of its brilliance. Now, I don't know about you, but if I turn around and see that, are you like, oh, hey, bro, what's up? (laughs) You're probably screaming in fear, right? I mean, it's kind of like the sword from the mouth and fiery eyes and white hair and, you know, these stars and lampstands. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead. He's like, I thought I was a dead man. But he laid his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died, but look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death in the grave. Write down what you have seen, both the things that are now happening and the things that will happen. This is the meaning of the mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and the seven gold lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So I kind of want to just give you a brief overview of these seven churches because... 
The next few chapters, uh, through chapters 2 through chapters 3, um, specifically address these seven churches. So you have the church in Ephesus, and I just want to give you a basic, like, what this church kind of represents, what this church had done, maybe why they're being addressed to these specific churches. Uh, the church in Ephesus, this is the church that had forgotten its first love. They had just forgotten their first love. Smyrna, the church that would suffer persecution. Pergamum, the church that needed to repent. Thyatira, the church that had a false prophetess. Sardis, the church that had fallen asleep. Philadelphia, the church that had endured patiently. And Laodicea, the church with the lukewarm faith. So this is just a, a brief description of these churches that John is specifically writing this revelation to, this letter to. All right, now, I, that, that's all I wanted to touch on that, just so we're aware of these churches. If you would, go to Revelation chapter 12. We're going to start in verse 1, and then we'll kind of backtrack and talk about what's happening here. Then I witnessed... In heaven, an event of great significance. I saw, the, I saw a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon beneath her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant, and she cried out because of her labor pains and the agony of giving birth. Then I witnessed in heaven another significant event. I saw a large red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, with seven crowns on his head. Now, I remember last week we talked about the ocean, the sea, and how this was a representation, this was a symbol of evil, of chaos, of confusion, and, and that there will be a day when there will be no more sea. So it's this representation of evil, and we talked about how the dragon was also a representation of evil. This is the dragon. His tail swept away one-third of the stars in the sky, and he threw them to the earth. He stood in front of the woman as she was about to give birth, ready to devour her baby as soon as it was born. She gave birth to a son who was to rule all nations with an iron rod. And her child was snatched away from the dragon and was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where God had prepared a place to care for her for 1,260 days. Then there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels, and the dragon lost the battle, and he and his angels were forced out of heaven. This great dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, the one deceiving the world, was thrown down to the earth with all his angels. Then I heard a loud voice shouting across the heavens, it has come at last, salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For, our accuser, for the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down to earth, the one who accuses them before our God day and night, and they have defeated him by the blood of the Lamb and by their testimony. And they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. All right, we'll stop there. So there's a few characters in this vision that John is having. You have the woman, you have the child, you have the dragon. So we're, we're told... The dragon is the devil. It's Satan. It's actually pronounced Satan. It, it simply means this, accuser. Uh, that's literally what this evil one's name means is the accuser. The woman in this imagery is Israel, the people of Israel. And the child, as we would know, would be Jesus. And so you have Satan, you have the dragon waiting for this child to be born to devour the child. But the child was swept to heaven. Israel flees into the wilderness to be protected. And that's this vision that we have. But I want to go back specifically to Satan in this story. This idea of being the accuser. There's a reality that every single one of us, we sin, right? We, 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 do, uh, we do hurtful things. We do dumb things. We do sometimes, as humans, terrible things. And there are consequences for actions, but there's also this accuser that is there to just constantly accuse 
And oftentimes, it's subtle. It's in quiet moments. It's not always overly loud. In fact, more than likely, maybe you've experienced a phenomenon like this where your day has gone pretty well and maybe you've even kind of forgotten about some of the things in your life that you've done and then you lay down in the quietness of your bed at night to go to sleep and the internal voice gets incredibly loud, doesn't it? And that accuser starts to accuse. That accuser starts to create doubts. One thing we have to remember in all of this is our battle is not against people. It's not against flesh and blood. It's against evil. It's against the accuser. And, and here's my fear with the church. We are so busy fighting people that, that we make a physical manifestation of evil, and it is. But we forget that there's a bigger war going on. We forget that there's a spiritual war happening all around us. And so we may, and we'll we'll put it in the context for our day and age, right? We may get on Facebook and go to battle with people. Meanwhile, evil continues. Meanwhile, the accuser still does his thing because we have taken a battle to a place that we don't need to take the battle. We get all maybe hot and bothered about some things that are happening in media or in culture and we're, you know, we're canceling this and we're not doing this and we're not doing that. Meanwhile, we're just fighting people. Now, let me give you two examples, and I think they're pretty great examples to follow. One being Jesus as he hung on the cross. What did he say to the people who were killing him and torturing him? What did he pray to his father? Anybody remember? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They're under some influence that is way bigger than they are. They don't know what they're doing. Forgive them. Then there's another guy by the name of Stephen who is like this first martyr that we see who was killed. He was publicly stoned for his faith and for his outspokenness of his faith and the word of his testimony. And he says in Acts chapter 7 verse 60, it says he fell to his knees shouting, not quietly as rocks were pummeling him, but he shouted, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. That was the last words he said. And then he died. So you have Jesus who didn't want these people charged with their sin. You have Stephen who didn't want these people charged with their sin. Meanwhile, today, us Christians run around wanting everybody charged for their sin, which is really hard to be a preacher of the good news when we desperately want to see people burn. Because do we really want them to have hope? Do we really feel like they deserve it? And I say all this simply to remind us, our war is way bigger than flesh and blood. It is a spiritual battle. But it's hard to imagine when we see things that happen in our world, specifically um, acts of terrorism against children. That's painful to watch. So far, over 15,000 children have been killed in the Israel Hamas war. Over 15,000 kids. You see things like the Uvalde school shooting. And we see these things happen in our world against defenseless humans who don't have a dog in the fight, who are just showing up for the thing that they're supposed to show up for as a kid. And we go, how could somebody do that and they don't have any defense? This is the way that Satan, the accuser, attacks the children of God. But here's the difference. We're not defenseless. We oftentimes will 
maybe pretend like we're defenseless or we think we're defenseless, but we actually have a really, really, really incredible defense. Chuck Pierce in his book, Restoring Your Shield of Faith, says this, Satan likes to fill us with doubt. To accomplish this, he plants questions in our mind about the goodness and love of God. When Satan approached Eve in the garden, his strategy was to cause her to doubt God's goodness. He insinuated that God did not have her best interest at heart and that God was trying to keep her from what would be best for her. This is the plan of attack. It's not overly complicated. It's not overly loud. It's not overly aggressive. It is very quiet and it is very simple. It's the accuser showing up like he did for Eve and going, how how could this God that created you treat you this way? I mean, does he really care about you? Does he really love you? Does he have your best interest at heart? Because why would he want, not want you to know these things? That was the plan. And it, listen, the plan still works today. These subtle, quiet innuendos that the accuser whispers to us, and they sound unique to each of us. Maybe, maybe the things that are whispered to you in the quietness of the evening or early morning are things like, who, who do you think you are that could deserve love? Do you think you deserve to be happy? To have joy in your life? Do you think you deserve mercy or grace after the way you have done this or said that? Maybe that's one way that the accuser whispers to you. Maybe another way is, hey, you don't really need those people. I mean, you've kind of got it figured out. You're doing pretty good on your own. You You don't need this community of people to have a healthy, joy filled life. I mean, it's the quintessential, like, get get the gazelle off to itself, right? In the hunting strategy. Because if we can remove them from community, Bad things happen. And whatever is whispered to you may be unique, but understand this. Satan is the accuser. And it's quiet and it's subtle. That's why I feel like in Revelations 12.10 we read this. Then I heard a loud voice shouting across the heavens. There was some volume. It was loud to be heard over the quietness of the accusations to be, uh, so it could be understood, so that it could be heard. It was loud. And then it goes on to say, it has come at last, salvation and power in the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down to earth, the one who accuses them before our God day and night. This is a 24-7 battle. And then we get to verse 11 in chapter 12, which is both encouraging and instructional. It it gives us a battle plan. It gives us our defense. It's how we get the accuser to shut up. And it's a pretty simple strategy. And it's incredibly effective. says this in verse 11. And they have defeated him, how? By the blood of the lamb and by their testimony. And, there's a big and, they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. So, three parts to this battle strategy, okay? And we're done. The first part is this. It's the finished Emphasis on the finished. This isn't just a cute church word. The finished work of Christ. What he did in that moment on the cross, it finished it. There there wasn't more to it. There wasn't a life that we needed to live in order to go, well, yes, it's the death and resurrection of Christ, but also I have to do A, B, C, X, Y, Z. It was finished. Jesus even said as he hung there, it is finished. 
And we have to understand and we have to believe, which is the second thing, is it's about the finished work of Christ, but it's also our belief in it. It's our belief in it. How strongly is our belief in the finished work of Christ? And I'm, I'm not trying to, like, I'm not trying to make you feel guilty, okay? But maybe there's, an indi- maybe there's some indicators that we can kind of gauge how strongly we believe in that finished work of Christ. Do we perpetually allow the accuser to bring up our past over and over and put us maybe in a state of depression or anxiety over it? Do we allow ourselves to be constantly have rough shot run over us about a life we maybe once lived or sins we once committed? Do we constantly bring those up to ourselves, and do we allow the accuser to speak that into our life over and over again? The last part of verse 11 also indicates that when we receive the gift of a right relationship with God, we value our eternal life over our present one. We understand this is a bigger war. We love these stories in movies and in books. I mean, we, we love the brave hearts of the world. We love the individual who is willing to go, I care more about the lives of my people or about some eternal thing than I do about this life right now. I will sacrifice my life maybe for the good of some other people or maybe for the bigger battle at play. We love those stories. But the way we build our lives, we get so obsessive about my life and how things are going for me and what I have to do. We're able to let go of our old life and embrace God's better eternal life for us. An upgrade we're willing to make even in the face of death for God's purpose. Again, we're reminded of a guy like Stephen and so many, and a guy like John who was in exile. and So many of the disciples that followed Jesus who lost their lives because of it, because they understood this. Ed Stetzer in his writing, Nominal Nation, the shift away from self-identified Christianity, says we do see that many nominal Christians in America are ending their identification with Christianity. Nominalism is dying. I say good riddance. I'm ready for the gospel to mean the gospel and for Christians to be known as Christians. People need to see that Christian isn't just a checkbox on a questionnaire, but it's a life changed by the gospel. I think we should seize this opportunity. We live in a mission field with an unengaged mission force. This idea of nominalism that, yeah, I'm Christian because my grandma was, and, you know, I got to fill out a a form on maybe a, a, a tax thing or some kind of a religious affiliation, and we check the box because it's just what, what I do, you know, it's who I am a little bit. This idea of nominalism is starting to disappear. And I I agree. I'm actually glad. I'm glad we're at least identifying who we are and where we're really at. I mean, think about it from a war standpoint. Right? You're you're on the front lines of a war, and you look at the, the guy or the gal next to you, and you go, are you ready to do this? And they go, no. I don't want to be here. You're going, this is going to go bad. (laughs) And when we talk about spiritual warfare, we're going like, we, we want people who are willing to go, hey, this, is, this life is temporary. There's a bigger battle. There's an eternal battle happening. And willing to lock arm in arms. How? And this is so simple. Right? This is so simple. The defeating of the enemy, the defeating of the evil one comes through the word of our testimony. Here's what that means. It's your gospel story. That's it. (laughs) That's it. And this this is why. 
we say things like you don't have to have a theology degree to read the book of Revelation. You don't have to have a theology degree to battle evil in this world either. And nobody has since the beginning of the way of followers of Jesus. It simply came down to the power of their testimony because we need to understand and we need to remember that your story has power. It has power and it has influence, especially with the circle of people that are around you in your life. And it has the power to quiet the silent accuser. Because sometimes, not only do we have to tell other people our story, we need to remind ourselves of our story. We need to remind ourselves of our testimony so that we can overcome these things that maybe have haunted us or that maybe get brought back up time and time again. So that's it. right? The finished work of Christ, our belief in it, and through the word of our testimony. And so here's the homework I want you to do this week, right? We're back to school. So they shouldn't have to be the only ones doing homework. We all need to do a little homework. I want you to take the time, because I think it'll be good for you too. I want you to take the time to sit down this week and write out the words of your testimony. Maybe it's a half sheet of paper. Maybe you need a ten ten blank pieces, pieces of paper front and back. If you're like me, you're probably not a writer, and you might need like a, a note card, right? That's okay too. And, and here, here's maybe a way to frame your story. This is who I was. This is how Christ captured me, and this is what my life has been like after. That's it. And there is so much power in reminding ourselves of that and being able to communicate that to other people. So I want you to write it down, and then I want you to maybe take it a step further if you're willing. I want you to share that with us. So once you write it out, I want you to email it to us, info at newhopecc.org. Because I think it's encouraging to share your story. And so I want you to write it down this week. I want you to email it to us, info at newhopecc.org. We want to collect those stories, all right? And so that's, that's the overview, right? The dragon and the woman and the child and just this, accusatory, quiet voice, but the loud voice needs to overcome that. Our testimony overcomes that. So be familiar with your testimony. God, we, we thank you for your finished work. We're thankful that there's not more that we have to do other than just believe in you. Allow you to to change us and allow your spirit to teach us and allow your, your spirit to put into effect in a powerful way our testimony. God, I, I, I pray for the person who maybe for years has battled in silence the accuser's voice that has continued to, to lead them into these dark places. I pray tonight as they lay in their bed for the first time, maybe in years. And instead of going there, they would be filled with hope and joy because of the work that you did. And because of the way you changed them. And that physically they would rest, but even that their soul would rest. And we're thankful, again, that you do the work. It's why we we worship you. It's why we praise you. That's why we pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. Let's stand and give our praise back this morning, church.
God for that this morning, church. Um, as you leave this morning, I want to make you guys aware we've got our new year at a glance book that is fresh off the presses. We would love for each of you to take one of those. It gives you all sorts of dates and things that are coming up for the next year. So grab one of those on your way out. We love you guys. We'll see you next Sunday.